Hi, good evening. My name is Salisa Kalki. I'm the director of New Projects here at the Alliance Theater. I'm so, so happy to welcome you to the second event in the Neil Ass series. And to tell you a little more about what we're doing tonight, it is my pleasure to introduce Sue Williams. Thank you, Salise. And I... <laughs> Thank you, dear friends who are there in the audience. I wish I could see you all, but uh, <laughs> I know you're there. And uh, I thought you might like to know a little bit more about Neil Asks and where that name came from. It, uh, these series of lectures honor my, the memory and legacy of my husband, Neil. And people tell me that the way he exerted quality leadership among so many different organizations in Atlanta and in North Carolina was by asking pertinent questions at the right time and that these questions, he would listen to the answers he got and then guide the people who, with whom he was working to then visual, uh, make a realization of their own vision and carry out what they hoped for innovation and future for the common good. He and I, these are gonna be semi-annual presentations and uh, they will all be on neilasks.org so if you want to refer to them later or tell your friends who had to miss that, that they can watch uh, the video on neilasks.org. And I'd like to give special thanks to the uh, Vassar Woolley Foundation and to the Print Pack Company and the Love Family for the initial funding for this series. Um, from 2002 to 2008, Neil served as the chair of the board of the Woodruff Art Center, and happily, the center is the fiduciary agent for Neil Asks. The Atlanta Symphony Orchestra developed the website and presented the first program last May with Donald Ronicles and Phil Kent, who were dealing with the question, how do the arts and business intersect? And so I'm very excited about this program this evening that'll be addressing the question of the role of live theater in a democracy. So I will turn it back over to Celise so that uh, the program can get started. But again, my heartfelt welcome to you all and appreciation for and deep thanks for your interest and support. Thank you. Um, so I just, uh, just one logistical thing, there will be a question and answer session and we will have people with microphones in the aisles. So if you have a question, just stay in your seat and raise your hand. We'll get a microphone to you. Um, and now it is my profound pleasure to introduce our uh, speakers this evening. Retired Chief Justice Lee Ward Sears, currently a partner at Schiff Harden. Pearl Clegg, our very own Mellon playwright in residence at the Alliance Theater, and Susan B. Booth, our Jennings uh, Hertz Jr. Artistic Director of the Alliance Theater. Thank you. So welcome, everyone. Um, and I get the uh, I, I get the shorter, long straw. I'm not sure uh, of speaking first. Um, I'm going to speak first about a, a connection that, that I draw between theater and democracy on three fronts. On the front of origin, on the front of empathy, and on the front of inclusion. I find it not at all coincidental that uh, Western theater and Western democracy as we know them were founded in the same place by the same people within a decade. I think. 6th century BC Athens was the place to be. And I think the origin stories of both practices have something critical in common, and that's empathy. Because what's presupposed in the notion of empathy is that I have the capacity to care about a story or a truth other than my own. And when you think about the founding precepts of democracy, and I recently went back to my, uh, sitting with a judge, right? I, I went back to some of my <laughs> ex, textbooks. Ex judge. Oh, well, that makes it much better. <laughs> um, it, it, Athenian democracy was direct participatory democracy. In other words, they didn't elect representatives to 
vote on bills and discuss civic matters, they showed up. And what that meant is that you gave over a sizable chunk of your time to be in audience to ideas that might be in flagrant opposition to your own. And you chose to do that. And the Athenians did that in great number. Theater as a practice presupposes that you sit in those seats because you have interest not simply in sitting in front of a really large mirror, but because, in fact, you are interested in listening to and considering stories other than your own. That, that seems like a simple foregone conclusion, that that would be a, a human desire. But I don't know how we have this conversation this evening without having a contextual reminder of a stalemate in our government that we are just barely on the other side of, and some would question whether or not we are, in fact, on the other side of. The notion that we as human beings have in our DNA the willingness to consider, listen, and contemplate beliefs, truths, and stories other than our own is not the foregone conclusion that I think uh, perhaps it was for the ancient Greeks, which to me is an argument for the necessity of theater and an argument for the necessity of democracy. And I'll finish, as I said, the, the, the three points that I, I find great intersections with democracy and theater are origin, our empathy, but also inclusiveness. There's a quote from Lorca that I love. A nation that does not support and encourage its theater is, if not dead, dying. Just as a theater that does not capture with laughter and tears the whole social and historical pulse, the drama of all its people, the genuine color of the spiritual and natural landscape, that place that does that, that does not do that, has no right to call itself theater, but only a place for amusement. Democracy is not for everyone but. Theater is not about everyone but. Both are founded on an idea of radical, concurrent, not sequential, inclusion. And those points of intersection make me hungry for conversations like this. Well, <clears throat> I'm not a theater person, obviously. And uh, I was quite honored when I got the call uh, or got the email to come and appear with two, I mean, really esteemed theater people, and particularly in a, uh, a series uh, that is, uh, uh, remembers the memory of Neil Williams, who was the managing partner at my first law firm, Alston Miller and Gaines, which became Alston and Bird. Uh, and I just wondered, why would you guys want to judge to mess up your, <laughs> your creative flow? You know? And I thought and thought and thought and read a little bit and, and Googled. And I was, you know, uh, read some books. It actually was a very good exercise for me. And, and last week sometime, I hit on it that, uh, in fact, democracy, which is what I know the most about, is live theater. I mean, it is live theater. Let me tell, just let me go through some notes. What democracy, like live theater, by definition, can only be done in collaboration. And the citizens watch the various plots unfold, like live theater. And they have to work hard to enter into a, a sympathetic understanding with one speaker and then with another speaker and then to try to sort out how they feel about things. In a democracy, just as in live theater, there are times when everybody seems right. Um, there are times when no one's really saying what needs to be said, right? Uh, we all know that. And you're sitting watching, wanting to scream out, uh, the, the emperor wears no clothes. Can't you see it? It's obvious. Uh, Another point I noticed about democracy, democracy, 
Like live theater is very much dependent on speech and must be done in public to have any kind of impact. And just as you said, Susan, it, it demands empathy from the people uh, they are designed to reach. Uh, that's to say, in a democracy as in theater, you have to leap empathetically out of who you are uh, to be able to understand. I mean, in a working democracy, and particularly when you're a judge, you have to get out from yourself and your own views and get into the shoes of somebody else to really understand what it is they're thinking and feeling and what moves them to really, to really be able to do a, a decent job. If you look close enough, uh, just like actors in a play, the politicians or the judges or the elected officials can tell you a hell of a lot about human nature. Just turn on CNN. Uh, you don't have to come to live theater. And I always thought, uh, 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 you know, being a part of the elected system was just show business. Show business for the people of a sort, you know. Both live theater and democracies evolve over time. Our constitution, for any right-thinking jurist or lawyer, has to evolve. It, it's, it's not static. And I know you guys have the discussion all the time, should theater evolve to the places or the people uh, of the, of the t new time? Uh, in a democracy, as in theater, the truth does not belong to any one single speaker. And it's, uh, in a democracy, as in live theater, all things eventually come to light because truth insists itself eventually. Beautiful. Beautiful. I love that. I didn't realize being a judge was so much like being a playwright because that's, exactly, <laughs> that's exactly what I'm always trying to do, which is to put myself in the in the shoes of these characters that I'm working with. Um, thinking about theater and democracy um, is so important to me um, because I believe that part of what makes a democracy strong, part of what allows people to think of themselves as citizens of a country and to feel connected to each other as citizens of a country is that we have accepted um, certain narratives that tell us who we are. Um, who is it that we believe ourselves to be as human beings who happen to be a part of this country? What does this country feel like? What do we think um, is admirable behavior for a citizen of this country? And I think that one of the challenges writing plays at this moment is that there are so many different ideas about what is admirable behavior for a citizen of this country. That's one thing. The other thing is that this country is so diverse that there are many, many narratives coming together with people who may have come from other places and are now Americans. So they're bringing with them a national narrative and they're joining with the narrative that we have as a nation. So that as a playwright, what I'm looking for always um, is a story that connects us as people in this country that connects us as American people. And it doesn't have to be um, a story where you put 20 different people and they're all looking different and they're all from different communities. It can be all people from the same community. But the kinds of people that they are, the kinds of characters that I create as a playwright, have to in some way put forward an idea, this is good behavior, this is not good behavior. When we talk at the most basic level about heroes and villains, sheroes and villainesses, then we know that part of what we're looking for is, what is it that we can see in those characters that looks like our lives, that looks like what we admire? So we can say, that's the good guy. We hope that agenda wins, or feel sorry when it doesn't, because that's what we want to see in ourselves. That's what we want to see reflected in our country. So that I always am very conscious of the challenge of making characters real enough and articulating them clearly enough so that when we see them from all the different places that we come before we end up sitting in this theater together, when we see the play, we can say, that's a good person. That's a bad person. It's impossible to read 
um, To Kill a Mockingbird or see the wonderful film of To Kill a Mockingbird and not admire Atticus Finch. It would be very difficult to do. Not to know that Mr. Ewell is the bad guy and hope that his interests are not served at the end of that story. Because it's all very clear, very complicated, very complex characters. But it's very clear what the author thinks and what the author thinks we should think at the end of that play, at the end of that book. So I'm always trying to get there to the point where we agree at the end about who did the right thing and we can think about it and talk about it. What were they up against trying to do the right thing and talk about it and think about it and hopefully get to the place where we don't argue as much and fight as much um, about what's a good guy, what's a bad guy, what does it mean to be a good elected official, a good president, a good congressman. But we can agree that the narrative teaches us this is a good person so that we can bounce our, our factual news against our cultural life, our cultural icons, and look at that and say, no, that's not a good person. Because every story from when I was a little kid going to the theater showed me a good person does this, a good woman does this, a good man does this, and then we can carry that forward. What's interesting to me is um, the Multiple, you, you, you talked about factual truth. And I'm, I'm obsessed by the number of truths that coexist around what we used to call facts, right? Um, I'm, a, I'm a gym rat, and I, I go to a gym that has a bank of, of television sets. And so I will watch on my treadmill let's just call names, CNN and Fox, reporting on the same event with the same, the same faces are showing up on the screen, but the interpretation of fact is very different. And what I'm intrigued by with this medium is that unlike film where a director has a final say on what you see and what you don't, what is edited, what is allowed, and presents it and walks away, and you see you know, the director's film. In this medium, here we all are at the same time. Right? We're all, uh, all going to be an hour older at the end of this. Uh, it's all happening at once. And so if something, if you hear something from one of us that doesn't coalesce with what another one said, you have to decide as opposed to the individuating that you can do with, well, I'll watch that news report. I'll hew to that, say, party line. The question that I have is, democracy finally is founded on the notion of multiple truths, but a single document. No. No? Many documents. Many documents? Many, many do You're saying... It's founded on just the Constitution? No. No. It's, uh, there are many documents now. I mean, every opinion I wrote when I was on the Georgia Supreme Court is a, was a document that created or espoused even more values. You know, it's, it, it uh, I mean, when I uh, interpreted cruel and unusual, which, is, which are words from the Constitution, 1700s into a modern life, then that opinion written in 2009 becomes yet something else. Right, you right. Know, and, and not as powerful, unfortunately, as the Constitution. <laughs> <laughs> but with its own power. Would, it's a question for both of you. Did you have your mind changed by arguments made by counsel, and do you write to change minds? I had my uh, argument, my opinions often changed by argument of counsel, and I too often wrote to change minds. Okay. I'm always writing to change minds. I want to make people think what I think. <laughs> <laughs> because that's the reason that I do it. Because I think that I know something 
um, and have discovered something and can find a story to make you think that too. And it isn't so much that um, I want to drag people kicking and screaming into what I believe. I believe that what I think is right about any given thing. So I'm always looking for a story that can take an audience through what I think is right so that they'll think it's right too by the end. So that if you end up at the beginning saying, okay, this is what I believe about this moment and create some characters who are in that moment, of course, because I believe certain things, I'm gonna take them on a journey that leads them to a certain place. And I want people to take that journey and then to be convinced by what I say. And I'm always aware of the fact that people are bringing all different kinds of points of view to the theater. So that what I'm always also trying to do is to hide the fact that I'm trying to convince anybody of anything. Because I know that I'm a minister's daughter. I know people do not come to the theater to be preached at. They go to church for that. So that instead of thinking of myself as now I'm gonna tell you the right thing, I'm trying to create these characters who are gonna show you how the right thing looks. But that you won't even realize that I'm taking you in this direction until you're too far into the story to get out of it. You like these people. You like Grace Dunbar. You like Evie Madison. You like these people so that then the way the direction they're going is a direction you're prepared to go, not because you think you agree with me as a playwright, but because you like these characters that I've made look like someone you know or would like to know. So that by the time you get to where you realize I have a point to make, you can't back away because you like them and you've gotta go with them and pull for them if I do it right. Pull for them to win. And their winning for me as the writer is them being able to exemplify what my point of view was at the beginning. If I don't do it right, then people instantly know that I'm trying to convince them of something, and they can do what we always hate for them to do at the theater, which is click from feeling something into thinking about it. And then they're gonna analyze it, and then they're gonna filter it through their intellect, as opposed to what I'm always trying to do, which is to get past the intellect and make people feel something. Make them love these people, make them cry for these people, not think about these people. Because we can always come up with a defense against a position if you're allowed to think about it. If you're allowed to feel it, then you can't, because you're there, you're already leaning forward. So a but question. that's what a, a brilliant politician does, though. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, there's no characters, but you're taking it in. I mean, that's what I do. When I would write, you know, I would, I would explain why. I mean, even though there might be three or four or five different reasons that could, go, could take it in another direction, I would take it in the direction I wanted it to go to, to build up the case for letting this person free or, or doing whatever it is. And, you know, you, you, to have the authority to be able to speak with authority so that people will follow you, you have to make a case, you know, and people come and you listen to every body and, and then you make a case and then you bring people along. If you're going to be a successful uh, public sphere kind of actor, uh, that's exactly what you have to do without, I mean, you've got to act it out. Mm -hmm. You're the actor. And is it an emotional activity as well as an intellectual Very activity? Very emotional activity and, and intellectual, intellectual as well. I mean, a zoning dispute doesn't require a lot of emotion. <laughs> Normally, but sometimes. but some, yeah, sometimes it does. But sometimes it can be extremely, you know, and and intricate, you know, because uh, you uh, you can't just throw anything up. You can't just be, you know, I'm the judge and this is how it is to be effective. You have to you have to move people along with you. You right. want them to move. You have to have the power to move people. So I'm, I'm curious, from both perspectives, what impact you feel our current modes of communication have had on our participation as democratic citizens, on our participation in theater. And, and by modes of communication, I'm specifically engaged by the notion that we can find uh, a media channel that will support our version of reality. We can self-select our, our sphere of influence down to a very thin slice level. And 
I asked about changing minds because I think that's become a rare event in my perspective. It's become a rare event. How is our, our public sphere, our means of communication affecting us as participants in democracy, do you think? You know, I don't know, uh, and, and again, you guys are the, the theater people, but I don't know if it's our mode. I mean, look, everyone is chatting at and yelling at and screaming at each other, and everything's black and white and, and all that. Uh, but it's so obvious that that is the case. It does disturb me that uh, Americans might be a little lazy in, you know, uh, not looking at two or three or four different channels and picking up the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal because I like living in this age of lots of information everywhere. I do think the media fails a little bit in uh, reading each other and not doing their job to really dig deep like they used to or they were when I was growing up. But nonetheless, there's still lots of information out there, and I think that's very good in a democracy if you will just become a democratic citizen and, and, and go for it. And absorb I think it we're through multiple channels. Absolutely, I do. I, mean, I think um, one of the things that bothers me is the attention span that we have. All of that hollering and all yeah. of that is, is difficult. But the fact that people want to know, get to the bottom line, tell me the, cut to the chase, cut to the chase. And part of the beauty of theater is you have to surrender to the telling of the story. That you're not really coming there to say, okay, tell me what happens at the end. You know, I can read the last page to you and you'll know what happens at the end, but the beauty of it is watching these people, getting to know these people, all of that. And it's very difficult to find people um, who are patient um, in this world that we have with all the technology. That now many theaters have a section of the theater where people can tweet while the play is going on because they can't wait till the play is over to say what they think about it. So that there's a special section where they can sit and tweet while the show is going on. I think that's terrible because you're removing yourself from the experience to report on the experience to someone who isn't there and you haven't had the experience yet. <laughs> so that that's a very difficult thing um, for me as a storyteller because that's really what I think I do. It's difficult to do that because you have to at least trust people to come and watch the story before they tell you whether they liked it, whether or not they agree with it, and whether or not they can say back to you what they saw. If you watch the first 15 minutes and start tweeting things, things may not even have settled into what the question is. So that the idea of, as you go along, commenting on the show is very dangerous to me. And people now do it with television shows. I mean, the actors from Scandal, I think, does it. Um, they will actually take tweets from people while the show is on. And I'm saying, how can they look away from what that woman is doing um, while the show is on to tweet about it before we've even seen where she's going. I think that's a real problem for us because being um, in a setting where everyone waits, the house goes to half, the lights are out and everyone is there looking toward the light to see the story, that won't happen if the only light is not in front of you. If there's also a light in your hand and in your neighbor's hand and in the hand of the person next to you, then it defeats the whole purpose of that ancient campfire thing where we gather around the campfire and tell the stories of our tribe and all of that. But we can't do that if everybody has their own torch. We can only do that if we're going to come together and look at the story and then talk about the story. So I have great concern about that, about people just being able to follow a thread for more than 10 seconds at a time. I mean, how many characters can you tweet? 140, something like that. I don't even know how you can say good morning in 140 <laughs> characters. People keep saying you should tweet, you should tweet. I don't want to talk in 140 characters. I want to tell the story. If it takes 400, I want 400. If it takes 4,000, I want 4,000. So you mentioned empathy playing a role in democracy. Right. Should It should play a role. Talk, talk to us about that. How, how does it benefit <laughs> the practice of democracy to have empathy present? Well, uh, when democracy is practiced as it should, uh, it, 
you should be able to listen to contrary views. I mean, where I spent 17 years on the Georgia Supreme Court. I sat with six other justices every week, and I listened to all of their various views, many of which I just couldn't stand <laughs> half the time. But I liked them. They were my friends. I sat patiently with them. I tried very hard to understand where they were coming from. I knew they couldn't be coming from where I was. I'm a black woman, 58 years old. Uh, most of them were white you know, men, much older than me. I actually, actually, at the time when I started, I was 36 years old. They were in their 60s, so it was even a... Uh, but it, it is worthwhile uh, for a functioning democratic uh, institution to, for people to sit and listen and really try to understand, you know, well, why do you, you know, what do you feel? What, what, you know, I saw the choir boys that really required you to, you know, get out from where you were on a Sunday afternoon and get into the heads of people that very not much not like me, but I could walk out of that theater understanding a little bit more about people I, I didn't understand and, and, and had very empathetic feeling, very, you know, and, and uh, I thought I became a better citizen as a result. I think that's what theater does. That's what theater, when it works, does. And that's what a democracy is supposed to be all about. It fails sometimes. You know, remember when Obama, that guy yelled, shut up or something. Liar. You, you, lie. you lie. I mean, that's, that's uh, not civilized. You know, that's not what a democracy is supposed to be about. Well, I'm, I'm curious, and from either side, there's the phenomenon of, of reality programming. Uh, in an interesting way, began sort of as an exercise in democracy, right? We asked people to vote. We asked people to vote on their favorite um, American idol or, or their favorite dancers. We asked them to vote. And I'm curious from your perspective, what is your, as a creative artist, what is your relationship to the, I won't call it the vote of an audience, but the decision-making of an audience about characters, about stories you are telling? Um, I think they have the ultimate vote because they can say, that was the worst thing I've ever seen. I will never go see a play written by that woman again. Or they can say, that was great. I believe those people. So that they, they always get to vote because they get to decide whether or not they're going to leave their houses and come and see, whether or not they're going to go to the bookstore and buy the book. Um, so that they, they ultimately have that choice. I don't like the idea at all of testing things and then changing it because people respond in a given way. Um, because I think that's pandering to the audience. I think that... Um, showing people something and then changing it because some people didn't like the end or they didn't like how that character went, then it becomes not the work of an artist who is trying to communicate something. It becomes kind of a commercial hodgepodge of how can we do this in a way that's going to make everybody take a look at it. So that I'm always interested in what people say afterward. I'm always interested in how they respond in terms of do they come see the next show or do they come see the next one. But I do not, um, I don't like all of that where people feel that they should be able to vote on how you proceed um, as an artist. I'm not, and you know this to be true, I'm not even a playwright who likes to give drafts to a director. I want to do it, have it done, and then hand it to you done so that your reaction is to as complete a work as I could do it. Um, rather than trying to wait and see, will she like this, will she like that? I want you to see what I think, and then you can tell me based on what I've done whether or not it worked or not. But I think all of that um, reality, uh, not, the, not the contest, the talent shows, that's, a, you know, that's kind of just a talent show thing, but I think all those other things where you have, you're following the Kardashian family or you're following these newlyweds, all of those are still scripted by writers. You know, the writers' union had to sue the producers because what they do is give them hours and hours and hours of raw footage and then say, okay, make a story. Find a villain.